Um, thank you all for joining us on this Friday afternoon. My name is Claire Whitner. I'm the Assistant Director of Curatorial Affairs and the Senior Curator here at the Davis. And this is our fifth Davis Discoveries, which is really exciting. They are some of my favorite programs that we offer. Um, because we started creating these programs when we were preparing for the reinstallation of our permanent collection galleries because we were putting all of this effort into research, consulting with specialists, and investing our funds in conservation projects. And these are not things that are necessarily evident to our visitors, and yet I think are one of the things that makes being a curator such a rich experience is that you get to bring together expertise from so many different perspectives. So, um, and we've gone through already five, four different objects. This We present our fifth. Um, our Mary Magdalene terracotta, which is a late 15th, early 16th century. It was acquired by the college in 1967, and there's been interest in this object from the very beginning. I think particularly to students of Professor Emerita Lillian Armstrong, uh, who taught for many years a class on Italian sculpture. Um, this will be a very familiar object and a beloved object. Now, when I start, first started assessing objects for the reinstallation with my former colleague, Eve Strausman Flanser, she was quite taken with this sculpture and you know, was excited because it really is a very specific type, um, one that was originated uh, by Donatello in the mid 15th century. And yet it was evident that sort of years of various repairs and overpaint were obscuring some of the forms and were not really letting us see the sculpture for what it was. Um, and so we brought on a, an object conservator from the MFA, Jerry Strickler, who you'll get to hear speak later on, to help us sort of look at this work and hopefully bring it to a state that was closer to its original form. So something that we like to do in these programs is to bring different perspectives together. And so I'm really pleased that we have three speakers today to talk about our Mary Magdalene. Um, our first speaker will be Dr. Lisa Raffinelli. She is a professor of art history at Manhattanville College. And her, she's a specialist in Magdalene iconography. So she will be here to sort of help us wrap our heads around Mary Magdalene as a, as a figure throughout art history, and quite specifically sort of thinking about Magdalene sort of wrapped in her hair. Um, and I will say that Lisa um, is a, uh, received her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts which is actually where our second speaker also <laughs> received her PhD and I believe shared an advisor. So it's really wonderful to actually bring the two of them together on this occasion. And Lisa's uh, PhD was on, the Mag on Magdalene iconography. So this has been something she's worked with for, for much of her career. Um, our second speaker will be Dr. Marietta Camberreri. She is Senior Curator of European Sculpture at the MFA Boston. And at the MFA, she's curated many exhibitions and installed many galleries that focus on Italian Renaissance sculpture. And lastly, we'll hear from Jerry Strickler, who is an Associate Curator of Object Conservation at the MFA Boston. And Jerry probably knows this piece better than anyone because she has spent so many hours. I think we decided on and again and off again for about a year working on this piece through various assessments of sort of the uh, pigment that we were looking at, looking at the forms and helping us make some important decisions about restoring this piece to its former glory. Anyway, um, I would like to welcome Lisa Raffinelli up to the podium first, and I'll just ask that you save your questions for the very end, and we'll um, invite all of our speakers to come up and speak, and they can engage in a dialogue together. So without further ado, Lisa. Thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers of this symposium for the invitation to speak with you today. It's an honor to be here and to share some of my knowledge about St. Mary Magdalene, which is a subject I've worked on for many years. Uh, my goal today is to present an overview of the representation of Mary Magdalene in Western art, while highlighting some of the important textual sources that inform these representations. Um, in so doing, I thought that we could together come to um, situate this newly restored Magdalene within its iconographic and stylistic context. 
Um, and here's just the uh, attribution information from the museum. Before I start, I just wanted to clarify one thing. I'm going to try to present the history of Mary Magdalene in the West in, roughly chronolog in a roughly chronological framework. But I'm illustrating this with works of art by a variety of artists and a variety of media, mostly medieval to Baroque, which themselves I'm not presenting in chronological order. So hopefully that little wrinkle will become clear. I tried really hard not to say, um, I'll explain this in a minute too many times. <laughs> um, and so we'll start at the beginning. Um, it comes to a surprise to many, comes as a surprise to many that there is relatively little written in the New Testament Gospels about Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, beyond that she was a follower of Jesus and that she provided for him and the others with her own resources. From this statement, we infer that she was a woman of independent means. We know that Magdala, which you can see here, has a number of alternate spellings, uh, was a well-known and prosperous city, uh, port city on the Sea of Galilee, which was destroyed by the Romans in about 75 CE. I hope you can see this, because this is just one of my favorites. According to the Gospels of Luke and Mark, Christ cast out seven demons or devils from Mary Magdalene. Here we're looking at a relatively rare scene of this exorcism. No explanation is given in the Gospels as to the nature of her affliction. Was it sin? Or as some scholars have suggested, depression? We just don't know. What we do know is that as her reputation changes over time, different explanations are offered for this action. Mary Magdalene was among the few who remained at Christ's side during the crucifixion. She's often shown at the base of the cross between Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary and John, and is the one to show the greatest emotional distress. Her distress is visceral, physical, and often anguished, and is typically in stark contrast to the mournful decorum of the Virgin Mary. And I put all of the information about the slides here just for you. I, I'm not going to necessarily stop on each slide and tell you uh, who it's by, but you know, take mental notes if you have questions for later. Uh, here we have the Isenheim altarpiece by Matthias Grunewald, where we can see the anguished uh, Mary Magdalene right here at the base of the cross. Um, this particular uh, emotionalism, this aspect of her character, is not something that's derived from scripture, but develops over time. We also see Mary Magdalene in lamentation scenes, as we do here, again at Christ's feet, and the reasons for that will soon become clear. Now, each of the Gospels state that Mary Magdalene, along with other holy women, or Mirafors, as they are called, because they carry mirror in an ointment jar, set out on the Sunday morning after the crucifixion to prepare Christ's body for burial. When they get there, they find that the tomb is empty. So depending on which account is being followed, we see two or three of the holy women approaching the tomb, and either two or three angels that greet them when they get there to tell them that the tomb is empty. Because of this role, that she has, uh, the ointment jar becomes one of Mary Magdalene's most recognizable attributes. Now, according to the three synoptic gospel accounts, and synoptic derives from a Greek term, which means basically similar, meaning that these gospel accounts align with one another, the holy women encounter the risen Christ on their way home from the tomb. He asks them to bring the news to the others. Representations of this event are often called the herete, or all hail, and we can see that it might be symmetrical or asymmetrical and may have two or three women again, depending upon which account is followed. The herete, together with representations of the holy women at the tomb, are among the earliest known image types depicting Mary Magdalene in Western art. Now, although the women were asked to bring the news to the others, the results are mixed. According to Mark, the women were afraid and remained silent. Luke writes that the women shared the news, but the men did not believe them. Matthew is silent on the issue, 
But since Christ instructed the women to tell the men to meet him at Galilee, and this is what they did, we assume that they spoke and were believed. According to the Gospel of John, which is not one of the synoptic accounts, Mary Magdalene remained at the tomb after the others left and was alone when she encountered the risen Christ. She, in she initially mistook him for a gardener, but recognized him when he called her name. In this English manuscript, you notice uh, Christ wears a gardening frock, which is quite common, and this scene is set within an enclosed garden. Uh, I hope you can see the fence over here. And that is something that I'll get to in a minute, promise. Um, it also looks like he's smoking a cigarette, which I'm pretty sure he's not. I think, I think that might be the word Maria coming out of his mouth. It made me laugh, though. All right. Although there's no mention of Mary Magdalene trying to touch or hold on to Christ, according to John, Christ turns to her a second time and says, do not touch me or perhaps do not cling on to me, noli me tangere, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. The image type that develops from this account, known as the noli me tangere, first emerges in the late 9th century and becomes increasingly popular in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. In both of the examples I'm showing you, Christ's pose is sort of bi-directional, or uh, our historical word is chiastic. Um, and it kind of embodies the whole story. He turns back and looks down to address the Magdalene, whose concerns are more earthbound, but his, po his body pivots away, avoiding her touch, but more importantly, poised to begin his journey toward ascension. In the Fra Angelico, on your left, you also see the rock-cut tomb, which is a detail from the Gospel of Matthew. And again, notice that we have the fenced-in garden. When the solitary Magdalene brings the news of the resurrection to the male apostles, she assumes the role of what's called the Apostolorum Apostola, or the Apostle to the Apostles. Representations of this event are extremely rare, uh, probably because at this moment, Mary Magdalene has primacy over the men, uh, something that didn't necessarily sit well with the men of the early church. As Paul wrote, Within the church, women are not permitted to teach or have authority over men. And therefore, it may not come as a total surprise to you that when you do see this scene, it tends to be found in books of hours owned by noble and highly educated women. And that's basically it in terms of the scriptures. Um, but as you know, there's a lot more to Mary Magdalene. There are numerous exegetical or extra-biblical writings that contribute to our understanding of her character. Among the more influential are the works of early third century Roman theologian Hippolytus. It is he who makes the comparison of the Easter morning search of the holy women and their subsequent encounter with Christ to the bride's search for her bridegroom in the Canticle of Canticles or Song of Songs. As I'm sure you know, the Song of Songs is a poem in the Old Testament that celebrates desire and erotic love between a lover and beloved, the bride and bridegroom. Within both Jewish and Christian tradition, the poem is interpreted metaphorically. And in Christian tradition specifically, it's understood to refer to the love between Christ and his bride, the Christian church. Here we see the Noli Me Tendre in the center of this page from what is called a Biblia Pauperum, a woodblock text with illustrations that pairs scriptural events by type, uh, typologically. And it may have been designed as an aid for preachers as they prepared for sermons. The Noli Me Tangere here appears between, I know it might be projecting a little bit small, uh, the king's discovery of Daniel in the lion's den and the reunion of the bride and the bridegroom on the right. On the top left of the page, the text reads in part, the king signifies Mary Magdalene when she came to the sepulcher. The commentary on the top right reads in part, the betrothed woman signifies Mary Magdalene, who seeing her beloved, that is Christ, wanted to hold him. And the scroll over the reunited lovers 
reads, I held him and I shall not let him go. So this brings me back to the detail that I promised to get to, which is the inclusion of the fence or the enclosed garden in representations of the Nolimi Tanjiro. Sorry. This too is derived from the Song of Songs, where, lo where the lover describes his beloved as a locked garden, by which he means chaste. Typically, all of these metaphors, the locked garden, the bride of Christ, the personification of the church, are associated with the Virgin Mary. But early Christian fathers and exegetes, such as St. Augustine, saw many parallels between the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene, particularly at this moment of the post-resurrection encounter. For example, Augustine wrote, because man's fall was occasioned by womankind, man's restoration was accomplished through womankind. A virgin brought forth Christ, and a woman announced that he had risen from the dead. Thus, we often see parallels in the visual arts between the Annunciation and the Noli Mi Tangere. These are two frescoes by Fra Angelico from San Marco. They're located in close proximity to one another within the monastic dormitories. And if we could zoom in on the gardens, appear to almost share a contiguous garden space. OK, I know that's text to read, but I'll read it for you, just to complicate things a little bit more. There are a number of women mentioned in the Gospels who are at times confused with Mary Magdalene by early writers. Luke mentions an unnamed sinner who visits the house of the Pharisee and anoints Christ's feet with myrrh, wiping away her tears with her long hair. There's no reason to assume that her sins are sexual in nature, but her long, unbound hair at the time is associated with licentiousness. Then there is the unnamed woman who anoints Christ with perfumed oil in the house of Simon the leper in Bethany either by pouring it onto his head, as in Matthew and Mark, or his feet, as in John. And finally, there's Mary of Bethany, sister of Martha and Lazarus. According to John, at least, Mary of Bethany is the same woman who went to the house of Simon at Bethany. So depending upon which account you're reading, there are two or three distinct women, one of whom's named Mary, in addition to Mary Magdalene. Until the late 6th century, the Western church maintained that these were distinct women. And this is the theory of plurality, which actually persists today in the Eastern church. This gives way in the West to the theory of unity in the year 591, following a number of sermons delivered by Pope Gregory the Great. In Rome in 591, Gregory pro proclaimed, she whom Luke calls the sinful woman and John calls Mary is the same Mary from whom, according to Mark, seven devils were ejected. That's quite the sentence, I know. What could the seven devils cast out signify, he wrote, if not all the vices? Clearly, this woman previously used unguent to perfume her flesh for illicit acts. And just like that, Gregory created a composite, far more complex Magdalene, a woman who would now be known as the Beata Peccatrix or the Holy Sinner, a prostitute who earned forgiveness and grace because of her penitence and devotion to Christ. After Gregory, Mary Magdalene assumes a variety of new roles in the visual arts. It is now she that anoints Christ's feet at the house of the Pharisee. And so we can add to her attributes long hair, tearfulness and regret, and it seems an obsession with feet. Uh, we also see here that the ointment jar that carries myrrh now has more than one layer of meaning. She is the one that Martha complains about when Christ comes to visit, because Martha does all of the housework while Mary just sits and listens. And Christ rather unkindly says, well, she's chosen the better part. 
With this, though, Mary comes to represent contemplative, the contemplative way of life, while Mary represents the active. And this is important. We're all we're building up to our Magdalene. Right? And finally, um, Mary, along with Martha, are the ones who ask Christ to raise their brother Lazarus from the dead, which he does out of love for the family. By the late 8th to 9th century, Gregory the Great's sermons were incorporated into a growing body of hagiography or legend. The so-called Vita Eremitica, written by a southern Italian monk, fleshed out details about the Magdalene's life. And as it turns out, and of course in part, well not in part, because of Gregory, conflated her identity with that of St. Mary of Egypt, a penitent prostitute who spent 30 years as a hermit in the desert. Mary of Egypt was a popular saint in the Eastern Church and in Byzantine icons is portrayed as an older, emaciated woman dressed in a hair shirt. I mean, this is probably very hard to see, but I'm just talking right here about this uh, image. The Vita Eremitica changed Mary Magdalene's identity and the ways in which she's represented. She may now have overgrown, unkempt hair that covers her body, like Mary of Egypt. And her contemplative nature and penance now take the form of a life of solitude, asceticism, and bodily neglect. And what I'm showing you here is what's thought to be the earliest surviving representation of the saint as a hair-clad penitent. And it's from Perugia, uh, dating to 1225. In the late 9th to 10th century, a sermon written by an anonymous monk from the Benedictine Abbey of Cluny expanded upon the Vita Eremitica and painted a vivid portrait of the Magdalene as a flesh and blood woman, a beauty who abandoned herself to sin and pleasure and whose path to redemption was an inspiration to all. Repeated annually on the feast day of the Magdalene, which is July 22nd, this sermon becomes enormously popular and helps to stimulate widespread cult devotion to the saint in Burgundy. It also appears to have stimulated additional legends, particularly French legends, which provided additional de details about Mary Magdalene's travels after the resurrection. Apparently, she took a boat from Palestine and landed in Provence. And here we see her journey. As the cult of the Magdalene grew and spread, these disparate legends and traditions were woven together into more fully fleshed out biographies, the best known of which is the Golden Legend of 1260, written by Giacomo da Varazze or Giacomo Voragine. In the Golden Legend, we're told that Mary Magdalene was born, sorry, born to royal stock and was renowned as a youthful beauty, as well as for her wealth and her extravagance. Although she had abandoned herself to a life of pleasure and sin, when she heard Christ speak at the house of the Pharisee, she tearfully repented and became a loyal, loyal and beloved follower. 14 years after the resurrection, she, Martha, and Lazarus were cast out of Palestine. They travel by sea to Provence in a long and miracle-filled journey. Once they settled in, Mary became a missionary in Marseille and Aix-en-Provence, actively converting the Gauls. And here we just see, it's not a particularly common representation, but an image of Mary Magdalene preaching in Marseille. A while later, Mary Magdalene retires to a naturally cut cave or grotto in the massif or mountain range of Saint Maximin la Saint Baume. So just to show you, she lands here. She has activities here and here. And this is the area where she retires. Here. Um, here she lives for 30 years until her death. Uh, and we can see the naturally occurring grotto here and then inside of the grotto. Um, which became a very popular pilgrimage place, and which, for your information, was off limits to all women. Just saying. Sorry. 
Look how cute. Here she is. In solitary retreat, sitting in her grotto. Um, she had no food, no clothes, no water, no basic human comforts. She didn't need it because luckily seven times a day she was lifted up to heaven by a multitude of angels and was fed with the Holy Eucharist. While this happened, she was enraptured by the glorious chants of her celestial hosts. This divine sustenance was all that she needed to survive for 30 years. At the end of her life, she's visited by Bishop Maximin, who gives her communion, administers last rites, and buries her. And so I did want to show you a couple of scenes, you've already seen a few, that get added to her repertoire because of these legendary accounts. The miracle-filled sea voyage, a saint praying inside of a cave, and scenes of her elevation and ecstasy. And sometimes this elevation is referred to as an assumption, but we want to be careful not to confuse it with the Virgin's assumption, because that assumption occurs after death, and this one instead occurs seven times a day so that she can get fed. In 1279, probably due to the steady stream of pilgrims, the Magdalene's remains were discovered in the crypt at St. Maximin, after Mary Magdalene herself had appeared to Charles of Anjou in a dream. These relics were authenticated by Pope Boniface VIII in 1295. And I know this is totally off topic, but I can't not do it. Um, these relics include a piece of skin from her forehead uh, that Christ apparently touched during the garden encounter. And here we see uh, the relic that contains her skull, and there's a little vial down here with this, this piece of skin, um, which is called the Noli Me Tangere, oddly enough. Devotion to this relic, particularly in France and countries north of the Alps, leads to the emergence of a new iconographical motif in, with, in which Christ appears to the solitary Magdalene and despite his words, touches her head. Um, and just so you know, John Calvin had a field day with this relic, calling it a shameful bit of wax. The, Mag the Magdalene's popularity as a penitent became even more widespread in the 13th century, especially after the founding of the two great mendicant orders. Both the Franciscans and Dominicans made the preaching of penance central to their mission and adopted the Magdalene as an exemplar of effective piety, humility, self-denial, and penance in their sermons. And here I'm showing you two crucifixions in which both saints, here we see Dominic, and down here is a little itty bitty Francis, um, assume the position of Mary Magdalene, accepting her humility and her devotion to Christ on the cross as their own. St. Francis's devotion was so complete that he's often referred to in text as Altera Magdalena, a second Magdalene. And in 1295, when Pope Boniface VIII authenticated the relics of St. Magdalene, Maximin, the Dominicans became the official guardians of the crypt, and she became the patron saint of the order. This is going to be a little hard to see, so I'll, I'll try to help. Uh, mendicant devotion to the penitent Magdalene and to the Provençal relic sites helped spread devotion to the saint on Italian soil and had a profound impact on literary and artistic production. I've already showed you the first known representation of the Magdalene as a hair-clad penitent from 1225 in Perugia. The earliest known cycle of the, Ma the Magdalene's life in Italy, and when I say that I mean as opposed to including Mary Magdalene in a cycle of Christ's life, um, is found in this altarpiece believed to come from Franciscan circles. And I hope you can see, I've labeled it, so hopefully that's uh, helpful. Um, it blends all of these, it blends scripture, Southern Italian legend, and French legend. So we have the anointing at the house of the Pharisee, or maybe Bethany, the raising of Lazarus, the Noli Me Tangere, Mary preaching in Marseille, the elevation of Mary, uh, further feeding of Mary when she's in her grotto, Bishop Maximin offering final communion, and then the death of Mary Magdalene. Unfortunately, we don't know the original location of this altar, 
but it is worth considering whether based on its content it may have come from a female space. The Franciscan poor clares, the second order of St. Francis, founded in 1212, were especially devoted to Mary Magdalene. In addition, convents dedicated to the rehabilitation of reformed prostitutes, women whose patron saint was Mary Magdalene, began to appear in great number during the 13th century throughout Europe, a phenomenon that's tied to mendicant reform and preaching. So for example, in 1257, Santa Maria Maddalena Penitente, a convent for reformed prostitutes, was founded in Florence. Again, we don't know about the original location of this work, but these convents did come to be filled with numerous images of their patron saint. I just wanted to pause for one moment longer on this. Uh, if you notice how the Magdalene, and, and it does pertain to our Magdalene, right? Now she's mine. Um, in the center of the altar appears so light-footed, right, that she seems very similar here to the elevation scene. Um, and if we try to imagine this altar in use, say as the host was being lifted during mass, it might have appeared to the faithful that the Eucharist was being offered to the saint as she rose heavenward. The scroll she holds offers encouragement and instruction to the faithful who seek the same intimate relationship with God. Do not despair those of you who are accustomed to sin in keeping with my example, return yourselves to God. By the 15th century, images of the penitent Magdalene were enormously popular in Italy, particularly in Florence. Fueled even more by the growing power and influence of the observant reform movement of the Dominican order and the powerful friar Antonio Pierozzi, who later became Archbishop of Florence. He's also known as Saint Antoninus. He sought to reform the Dominican order to its ascetic roots and reform Florentine society as a whole, which in his view had become materialistic, wasteful, and sinful. In his sermons, he referred to the Magdalene often as a penitential guide for his flock. And in later years, preacher Girolamo Savonarola did the same thing, invoking the Magdalene as an exemplar in sermons, exhorting Florentines to give up their lives of vice, vanity, and excess. And perhaps the most famous example of the penitent Magdalene tradition from this period is that of Donatello, an undocumented work of the mid-century, once located in the Florentine baptistry. Now, Donatello is not the first or only Florentine artist to have sculpted a life-sized life painted Magdalene from wood. Uh, Brunelleschi is said to have made one for Santa Trinita, which burned in a fire. Uh, and there are a number of other examples that were part of an exhibition of painted wood sculpture from 15th century Florence mounted uh, in an exhibition in the Uffizi at 2016. And you can see two of them here with their attributions based on that show. And I apologize for the distortion of this one. I'm sure she's not as fat as she looks, but I tried to capture a screenshot from a YouTube video. It didn't work that well. Um, these sculptures were much more common than is commonly understood and had a special role to play in dimly lit sacred spaces, illuminated by the flickering light of candles and oil lamps, redolent with the fragrance of incense and reverberating with the sounds of the choir. These life-sized, life veristically colored sculptures exist in three dimensions and therefore occupy a kind of liminal space between art and reality drawing the faithful in and appealing to them on a visceral level, far more so than we might imagine from a flat painting or a white marble sculpture. Donatello's sculpture is so famous not only because it has survived, but because it is such a powerful work of art, so emotionally devastating. The artist has eschewed conventional norms of beauty, giving us a haggard, emaciated woman ravaged by her years in the wilderness. And yet she is a woman who is exalted, transcendent, and possessing an undeniable spiritual beauty that seems to radiate from within. She's so completely transformed by faith that it appears poised to consume her entirely as if she's going to burst into flames. To paraphrase Emil Mal, we witness her beauty consuming itself like incense burned before God. 
Now it's all, I know there's, a, there's our altarpiece, one of the earlier Magdalens and two views of the Donatello. It's often said that he's embraced the example of the ascetic Mary of Egypt rather than Mary Magdalene of legend, who's regularly fed by being lifted up into the heavens. I'm not so sure. Um, I'm struck so much by her lightness of being. And notice the movement in her feet. There's a light footedness uh, that we also see in other works. You can see here the heel is elevated. And obviously, here we saw that she looked a bit like she was levitating. And I think Donatello hasn't made a choice, but has merged the two traditions coming up with something entirely new. Certainly other Florentine artists saw this potential, and there are numerous examples. I picked two, one of which I know Marietta Camberari is going to speak about, um, influenced by Donatello's sculpture, where the elevation is made explicit. Donatello's influence is also undeniable in the wooden Ma Mary Magdalene sculpture begun by Desiderio da Settignano in 1458, commissioned by Annalena Malatesta, a woman who devoted her energies to founding a convent for Dominican nuns. This is two views of the Desiderio and here the Donatello. Despite the similarities, however, Desiderio's Magdalene holds an ointment jar and casts her eyes downward which to me at least doesn't seem like she's ready to take flight. And by now I think it's self-evident where the Davis Magdalene belongs iconographically and stylistically. This is the aromatical penitential Magdalene of legend, haggard, emaciated, dressed in nothing but a hair shirt, her eyes cast upward, hands clasped in prayer. Stylistically, the artist has drawn upon the mid-century Florentine Donatellesque tradition even if, like Desiderio, we might think that she's a bit more grounded, uh, in this case, quite literally rooted, because of the tree that supports her. Now, I did this, and I'm going to undo it, because on the screen, everything appears to be the same size, when, in fact, Donatello's Magdalene is a bit over six feet tall, and the Davis Magdalene is an inch or so over two feet. Now, I tried really hard to do this in thirds. I think I'm close. <laughs> That striking disparity alone reminds us to be careful, because we're looking at objects created for decidedly different purposes. And I know I'm a little bit over, and I'm almost done. What was the purpose or function of the Davis Magdalene? Was she a model or a study for a larger sculpture, a standalone figure, part of an ensemble? What can we learn from the medium, polychrome terracotta, which was so popular in the 15th and 16th centuries? not only in Florence and Tuscany, but throughout Italy. I'm sure that we have a lot to learn from Drs. Camberari and Strickler on this issue. So now, I just wanted to end with a brief diversion because I wanted to include uh, a couple of other trends in Magdalenian iconography just to round this out. Um, because of course, representations change over time. As the penitential fervor of the 15th century yielded to the more optimistic humanism of the 16th, and as centers of production shifted from, Rome, from Florence to Rome and Venice, we encounter images such as Titian's 1531 penitent Magdalene, a new interpretation of the theme, a sort of ancient pudica infused with Christian morality. In Titian's hands, we see a celebration of the Magdalene's beauty and sensuality rather than beauty and sensuality denied. But as beautiful as she is, as unmarked by the rigors of her penitential practice, it doesn't much matter because she's abandoned the concerns of this world and is oblivious to our gaze. As she looks heavenward, limpid eyes brimming with tears, she's transcendent. During the post-Tridentine and Baroque periods, we often, but not always, see a little more clothing on our penitent Magdalens. We also see new attributes, a sacred text, a cross, a skull, memento mori, symbols of contemplation, the brevity of life, and the salvation promised by Christ's death. Of course, the Reformation ushered in a new world order. Martin Luther and others challenged sacraments not directly instituted by Christ, such as penance or devotional practices deemed attenuated from Christ, such as saintly intervention. 
Because the Magdalene had long been associated with both, she was subject to vicious attack by northern reformers who called for her cult to be abolished and all images destroyed. And yet the 17th century, particularly in Italy, has been called the Magdalene century. Her cult was not abolished, nor were images destroyed. Instead, devotion to the saint flourished, infiltrating all levels of society while images abound. As the church doubled down on its commitment to established practice and doctrine, Mary Magdalene was once again the perfect spiritual guide for believers. And I know that the Carlo Dolce isn't here right now, but she's coming home. Um, and so we find common purpose in the two Magdalens of the Davis. The second, of course, that of Carlo Dolci, 17th century artist active mainly in Florence, especially well known for his small scale devotional paintings. Despite the century that separates them and the differences in media and circumstances of production, both testify to the Magdalene's continued importance as an exemplar for the faithful seeking forgiveness and salvation. Who better to identify with than a flawed human being who had found a way back to a state of grace. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was really a wonderful way to get us started thinking about the sculpture. And I'd like to invite up Marietta Camareri, um, Senior Curator of European Sculpture at the MFA, to take us a little deeper into the sculptural side of Mary Magdalene. Um, uh, thank you so much, Claire, for inviting me to speak to you today. Thanks to Alicia, I think she's, Alicia LaTorres, I think she's out there, and Arthurina Fears. Thanks uh, very much for including me uh, in this, uh, in this um, symposium today. Uh, uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge two sources that were very important for me as I prepared this talk, uh, and that's the work of uh, Catherine Jansen uh, on Sermons on the Magdalene, working with Sermons on the Magdalene, and um, Teresa Flanagan working on uh, St. Antoninus. This terracotta sculpture of St. Mary Magdalene holds a number of mysteries. Since we know very little about its origins, it's not signed, and its author is not immediately clear. Its place and date of manufacture are a bit easier to detect. It was very likely made in Florence in the years around 1500, though this too is really still only speculative. It may have been made in Northern Italy, uh, somewhere like Milan or Ferrara, since the cult of the Magdalene was widespread. And I did look at um, some works by, that are associated with the sculptor, for example, uh, Domenico de Paris working in Ferrara, it's close. This, uh, another work associated with uh, Domenico, Close, but not really super convincing. Um, and so I really do think, and, that, and we're going to explore this in this talk today, uh, that this emotional, expressive, yet hopeful image of, the, of penitence and repentance uh, really does come from Florence. Given its relatively small scale, it's about 25 inches tall. So. Um, it was probably made as an object intended to inspire and sustain acts of private devotion for its owner, intimate acts of prayer and contemplation, either in a home, convent, or monastic setting. This is as opposed to being set into a church or chapel setting where its function would be similar, but uh, in, more public w in a more public way. But even with that, we can't completely rule out that possibility. So let's look at the object together to begin with. It's made of terracotta, so literally baked earth, uh, clay that has been modeled and fired in a kiln. And as we look at the figure in the round, we see that the back remained unworked and simplified, uh, which tells us that the statue was meant to be seen from the front, so against a wall, in a small niche, on a piece of furniture set high up, uh, the viewer would have almost always approached her from the front. Pathos characterizes her stance and her expression. She stands with her hands joined in prayer. Her head turns. She looks upwards. She seems to weep. Her mouth is open, her face lined, her body thin. Her hair has grown long and has become her only garment. 
The suggestion of landscape and the stump of tree place her in the wilderness. That tree would also have supported the weight of the figure as moisture evaporated from the fresh clay and it became drier and harder in preparation for its transformation in the kiln into the strong fired clay statue that we see today. Once out of the kiln, the artist, possibly the sculptor, possibly a painter working in collaboration with the sculptor, would have painted the figure, disguising the color of the red fired clay with more naturalistic tones of flesh, hair, and landscape. So one of the most difficult things to, uh, to um, about trying to recapture uh, what this statue once looked like is that the paint was really not a permanent uh, surface finish. It would have flaked away over time to be freshened up or possibly even completely repainted. And Jerry Strickler will have much more to say about the physical condition of the object. But some of our pressing questions for her, uh, which I did ask her, would be whether there are any traces of gilding on the surface. And she says no. Uh, does any original paint survive? She thinks so. And can we reconstruct the original peer appearance? Uh, and that is uh, a difficult one. But Jerry has done a beautiful job of seeking to do just that. But no matter what the state of the surface, the modeled clay was fixed by the firing in the kiln and does endure quite well. And so much of the power and expressiveness of the figure remains to be seen in the clay itself. So a word about clay sculpture in Renaissance Italy. The material itself is full of meaning and history. Some of the oldest sculptures that survived from the ancient world were made, were made in fired clay. The ceramic material uh, endures very well over time. Actually, the biggest risk is dropping the piece. Uh, it, if it falls, it shatters. Uh, and um, in Italy in the 14th century, the material was considered by writers, including the poet Petrarch, to be particularly humble and suitable for sculpture, especially for religious images, conveying in its very material the humility of the subject. So clay was gathered from riverbeds or pits. And here we see. Um, um, Uh, so here we see um, workers gathering clay from riverbeds uh, in, a, in a 16th century uh, treatise uh, on the potter's art. Um, and there are still, there were and there still are areas in Florence, for example, where clay that is particularly suited for making sculpture and ceramic vessels uh, is still quite plentiful. Um, and here's an image of Florence in, around 1500, and you can see that it really has not changed very much. The Arno River, which has fine clay beds, uh, both near to Florence and further out in the countryside, still runs through the city. And I like to see those little, those little swimmers as the little guys gathering clay. Um, and uh, here's a, a view of Florence today. So. Um, Clay, which is gathered and refined from sources that are close at hand, one should never forget that terracotta sculpture was usually made from the very earth of this very place. It's the original locally sourced material, right? Uh, and uh, so um, biblical associations that would have resonated for sculptors and for viewers alike would remind them that in, for example, the book of Genesis, Adam was formed by God from the clay of the earth transformed by the breath of life, just like a sculptor created a figure that was then transformed in the kiln. In the book of Isaiah, we can read, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you the potter. We are the work of your hands. So these association, associations almost surely um, uh, inform the interest in working in clay for figures which would serve devotional purposes, like this figure of Mary Magdalene who lived close to the earth in the wilderness in the late years of her life, as she is shown here. We should remember that there are always choices to be made as far as materials go. Wood, bronze, marble, clay, they all have their own particular characteristics and associations, which help to support and convey the meaning of the work itself. 
the antiquity of clay sculpture, the humility of the material, its local availability, and its relatively low cost, its reliance on the skill of the artist rather than the preciousness of the material, are just some of the values that we should consider when looking at clay sculpture in the Renaissance. In an image like this one, which depicts a saint in the wilderness, this woman who has uh, chosen to live as a hermit, humiliating her flesh through fasting, and having thrown off the brilliant and beautiful clothes that she might once have worn, these associations of clay seem especially fitting to consider. And here I think that we can say in significant ways, the medium is the message. The material is a part of the story. So there are a number of works uh, for domestic use, made for domestic use in Florence in the 15th century that help to create a context for this figure. And I'd like to show you some of them now. We know from written sources that works of art in domestic settings were seen as aids for prayer. One very famous example is found in a manual written by uh, the Dominican friar Giovanni de Medici around 1405 for a woman whose husband had been exiled from Florence, leaving her to run the household and raise her children. So Domenici describes the kinds of images that he encouraged for use in the home as part of socializing children to be good Christians as well as good citizens of Florence. He highlighted the way works of art could sustain and support faith and devotion in the home. For example, he describes the many different types of Madonna and child images that could be represented. And again, remember there are choices involved. If a Florentine home had one image, it was likely to be a Madonna and child, usually bought around the time of a marriage or the birth of a child. And wood could one can choose, for example, a painted image or a sculpted one, a clay image or a wood sculpture. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, image would likely remain in the family across one's life, across generations in a family, and uh, in different ways and at different times in people's lives. So uh, I show you this one by Luca Della Robbia because if I could have a Madonna and child, I would choose this one. Um, and um, Domenici also encouraged having images of saints with their attributes, which could teach and amuse children, as well as images of the patron saint of Florence, Saint John the Baptist. And so in an Im image like this bust of the young Saint John, according to Domenici, uh, and this is at the MFA, uh, this would allow young Florentines to see themselves in their patron saint, to mirror themselves uh, in uh, St. John the Baptist. He describes the scene of, of, which is known from devotional treatises, of the young toddler saints, the, the baby Jesus meeting his cousin, the young St. John the Baptist, in the desert. And such images could be entertaining as well as expressive uh, um, and, and, and instructive. Children were encouraged to perform acts of devotion, like putting flowers in front of these images, decorating them, candles might be lit in front of them. And so children might feel a special closeness to St. John, and by extension feel related to the baby Jesus. As, as an aside, I would just note that this, this takes place in the wilderness, and that's something that um, it shares with our Magdalene, and it's something that we'll return to later on. We would have to imagine that this harsher image of the Magdalene was likely made for adults and not children um, and to encourage penitence and prayer. But it's helpful to realize that Florentines were encouraged to interact with images in these ways from childhood. So we know that images could be dressed or adorned with jewelry, and these actions were not, were not limited to children, but carried on into adolescence and adulthood. Nuns in convents often played with images of the baby Jesus, uh, these sort of holy dolls, which uh, could be dressed and wrapped and kissed uh, to create a sense of intimacy with and love for the baby Jesus. Another group of domestic images uh, helps to give context to the Magdalene, images of the biblical heroine Judith, who seduced the enemy of her people, Holofernes, with food and drink and the promise of more, in order to slay him and save her country, and figures representing the civic and domestic virtue of abundance. And these are known in a number of examples from the workshops of the Della Robbia family in Florence around 1500 and into the first decades of the 16th century. 
They relate directly to work to important public statues in Florence made by the great 15th century sculptor Donatello. Uh, and you see uh, Donatello's Judith uh, inside Palazzo Vecchio where you see it today. But originally it was in uh, the main civic square and you can see uh, the copy that's there. Well, sort of there uh, today. Uh, his, uh, his, so she comes to embody a, a, an idea for Florence itself, representing uh, the small and weak, but smart and just, the town would overcome all enemies. Donatello's figure of abundance uh, is now lost, but she once stood atop a column, and here you see a, a, a reconstruction. Where is she? Uh, she's over here somewhere. There. I can't see her from that. There she goes. <laughs> um, so the figure is now lo lost, but we know it from reflections, uh, like this uh, Della Robbia sculpture. And she stood in the main market square with her horn of plenty and her basket overflowing with fruit, and she represents the health and well-being of the city of Florence. Owning one of these smaller scul uh, scale sculptures and displaying it in your home marked you as a Florentine and expressed the hopes and dreams a Florentine family could aspire to. These figures are, like the Magdalene, made of clay, and they are on the same uh, domestic scale. All of these sculptures are turning out to be about 25 inches tall. Mm -hmm. So there's, this is, um, it's, it's really the domestic scale for this type of figure. Um, Uh, the the Della Robbia figures, of course, are glazed in, this, in the signature glazes of the Della Robbia shop, brilliant shining colors that endure the test of time. The brilliant shine of colors and color of glazed terracotta offers a declarative message of alliance with civic virtues and loyalties. And this highlights the contrasting choice made uh, for the figure of the Magdalene. The more naturalistic painted surface would not be bright, strong, and reflective but softer, more intimate, allowing for a more humble message to be conveyed. And of course, the sculpture also relates very closely to an important sculpture by Donatello, as we've already seen in Lisa's talk, the wood sculpture of the penitent Magdalene. Close, uh, close to life size, uh, the carved in wood, highlighted with gilding, it was likely made for a church setting. It inspired other large-scale sculptures in public religious settings, like the Desideria that we've looked at uh, in Santa Trinita, or this glazed terracotta Magdalene by Andrea della Robbia, or this partially glazed terracotta by Giovanni della Robbia, which I actually think has some close parallels to the Magdalene uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in her face, for example. But Donatello's uh, Magdalene is clearly the most significant source for the Davis terracotta. Uh, and like those figures of Judith and Abundance, having a sculpture like this at home uh, clearly uh, created an association with the, work by, with the work by Donatello and all that that might signify. It fits closely with a group of works representing the Magdalene, um, also made on a domestic scale, about 25 inches tall, uh, and uh, very likely made in the same year as the decades around 1500, like the Mary Magdalene uh, that Lisa's already shown us, uh, also at the MFA. It's a type known in several versions, and I show you another version of it at the Victoria and Albert. This means that it was a, a, popular, a popular image. Uh, Donatello's public sculptures uh, would have stood for the glory of Florentine artistic genius, civic virtues, and domestic and, and religious devotion. And in fact, in the years around 1500, there was a true Donatello revival. Uh, for example, uh, the St. John the Baptist uh, at the center, also in the MFA's collection, uh, is closely related to works by Donatello, including the wood sculpture of St. John the Baptist in Siena, and, uh, and even more strongly, I think, related to Donatello's Magdalene. There are particular reasons why Donatello's Magdalene exerted such strong influence in the 1490s and early 1500s. We do not know, we actually do not know anything about the original commission for Donatello's Magdalene. We don't know its original location or who paid for it, and we don't even know for sure when it was made. It could have been made either in the 1430s or in the 1450s. 
But we do know that uh, in 1500, in the year 1500, and I just found out the date, it's October 30th, so it clearly probably relates to uh, All Saints Day uh, c coming up on November 1st, uh, it was placed into the baptistry in Florence. And we don't know if it was placed there again, that it was, might have been commissioned for the baptistry, might not have. But we know in 1500 it went back into the baptistry. Um, and this is, um, of course, one of the most important uh, religi religious and civic structures in the city. It's a centralized building uh, that in its own time, in, in, in the Renaissance, was believed to be an, of ancient Roman origins. All Florentines were baptized into their faith in the baptistry. And it is dedicated, of course, to the patron and saint of Florence, John the Baptist. It was decorated inside and out with some of the most important works of Florentine art, including the famous doors by Andrea Pisano and Lorenzo Ghiberti. So putting the Magdalene there in, again, or putting him, her there in 1500, had strong religious and civic meanings. In the later uh, 1400s, especially in the decade leading up to the millennial year of 1500, a period when the fiery Dominican, Dominican, Dominican preacher Savonarola had called for repentance, humility, and simplicity, Mary Magdalene became an especially important model of penitence for all Florentines. In Florentine imagery, the Magdalene became a sign or type for Florence as a city, as you can see in uh, Botticelli's crucifixion at the Fog, or rather the Harvard Art Museums, where uh, her, uh, her penitence and, uh, at the base of the cross is directly related to the city of Florence. She stands in for Florence. Her heightened emotion and grief express the need for penitence. And in other images, like uh, this uh, Trinity, uh, she was paired with St. John the Baptist, uh, becoming, through these associations, like another patron saint of Florence. So these two hermit saints shared the experience of living in the wilderness. And uh, for example, Filipino Lippi uh, uh, pairs them in this way. And so this is the way Florentines chose to represent them in, sculpt in paintings and in sculptures like the Davis Magdalene. Other small-scale sculptures in uh, terracotta likely made for domestic use include a group of bucolic images of the young St. John in the wilderness. So taken all together, such domestic images of saints in the wilderness, especially saints like John and Mary Magdalene, both of whom stood for Florence, spoke for an important aspect of Renaissance Italy, especially in, a cos in the cosmopolitan wealthy center of business, trade, and commerce like Florence. There is the desire to escape from the city and all its distractions, trappings, and intrigues to places where contemplation, prayer, peace and quiet, and the salvation of one's soul could be pursued. These images promised exactly that. If the viewer could not escape the realities of city life physically, perhaps he or she could escape it mentally with the help of an image like this Mary Magdalene. She could provide a companion for the soul and the mind in a virtual pilgrimage to salvation. Painted images like this contemplative work by uh, Philipp Filippo Lippi shows the Magdalene, along with another uh, hermit saint, Saint Jerome. And uh, here are a couple of representations of Saint Jerome in the wilderness. Uh, as when one uh, terracotta sculpture in storage at the MFA, and guess how big it is? It's 25 inches tall. Um, so uh, these are the kinds of images that I think uh, help us understand the Magdalene. We see this kind of pilgrimage image in a Maiolica sculpture at the MFA of St. Francis in prayer before a crucifix. This likely represents Laverna, the mountain uh, setting where he would, where St. Francis would receive the stigmata, so the physical uh, signs of Christ's passion uh, that appeared on his body through his, devo that through his, thanks to his devotions and faith. 
This is one of those devotional toys, like the infant St. John and, and Jesus in the, in the wilderness. The owner could place flowers into it. You could actually let water run through it into the fountain. Uh, these are all ways of um, honoring the scene, making it seem like a real landscape setting, enlivening it. The spiritual point of view uh, that one approached such an object with allowed the devotee to imagine that he or she was at Laverna with St. Francis and with Brother Leo. Um, and here, uh, just to give you a sense, this is a, a painted image of Laverna uh, by Ghirlandaio. This is Laverna itself, the wilderness. And here are two shots from my pilgrimage to Laverna, it, uh, March of 2016, snow on the ground. It felt like you were at the end of the world. So perhaps this was a souvenir of an actual pilgrimage, one, which one could relive. Uh, or perhaps it was an object that could substitute for the real voyage by encouraging a pilgrimage of the mind and the soul. Many devotional treatises uh, of the time encouraged exactly such devotional practices um, of journeys taken in the mind and in the soul in the intimate spaces of the home or the convent. This is one of the most important functions of the small images of the crucified Christ in wood, ivory, silver, bronze, gold. The Florentine archbishop and later Saint Antoninus describes using a small crucifix that could be held in the hand or set on a table for close looking, outlining like a pilgrimage, the direct and intimate encounter with the body of Christ as a way to meditate on the passion, the suffering and death of Christ. Savonarola encouraged exactly this kind of practice and performed it himself as this medal demonstrates. You can see him grabbing, the, the, the really grasping the, uh, the, the crucifix in his hands. And you can see uh, that that crucifix still does survive at San Marco in the cell that uh, Savonarola occupied. This is the spiritual world that I believe the Magdalene was made for as a spiritual aid for the faithful person practicing contemplation, and uh, meditation. So let's uh, re return to her uh, and consider the kinds of associations that she evokes in this role of spiritual tour guide, a companion to the pilgrim who must make his or her journey without leaving the confines, confines of home, convent, city. The Magdalene was the prime example of conversion and penitence for Renaissance viewers, both male and female. The sculpture evokes the spiritual efforts that she made through fasting and faith, her reward, as we've seen in, uh, in Lisa's talk, was that she ate only the bread of angels, the Eucharist, who lifted her up for her daily sus sustenance. And that is the scene that you see in the, uh, in the MFA piece. This was physical sacrifice and effort resulting in spiritual reward. Her body is slender, but it is an athletic thinness. I think today we might actually see the physique of a long distance runner, male or female, uh, her body transformed by her devotion, and her body is revealed to the devotee. She was characterized in her life before conversion and during Christ's life by her long flowing he hair. And here, here, that hair is transformed into her clothing, the only clothing for her thin body. Humility and rejection of all the worldly goods and vanities that characterized her life are displayed for the viewer who in Florence in these years had experienced dire calls for penitence and rejection of vanity, wealth, and display. The humility of the clay here takes on strong significance. And for the Florentine who could not completely abandon the world, at least in private acts of devotion, he or she could become this athlete of virtue. The Magdalene's life was characterized by emotion, her unbound hair, and uh, a sign of her unbridled emotions of love, repentance, and grief expressed in all, um, in all of her close interactions with Jesus. And here uh, she is allowed uh, the emotions, in, she's allowed her emotions in ways that people living in societies like Renaissance Florence were not. Though we may think that she was likely made, that we would, though we might think that it is likely that Mary Magdalene was the focus of female devotion in particular, we know that to be true, but she was also a model for men the need to express and experience these deep emotions is not gender specific. Keeping emotions in check or expressing them properly or channeling them in positive ways 
was very much a part of masculine life as well. And St. Antoninus had a very uh, st uh, strong personal devotion to the Magdalene. And so the Mary Magdalene could uh, serve these spiritual needs in both men and women. Her great power came from her love and devotion to Jesus and to her physical exertions in the wilderness. The Magdalene is a sign of the purification of the soul. She's sometimes um, described as a fountain, purified and purifying through her tears. Thus, she's also a sign of hope. And the gesture of Donatello's Magdalene is not um, simply one of prayer for her fingers do not touch, uh, set in the baptistry where sin is washed away and the soul emerges cleansed. Hers was also a gesture of hope. And that is true of even of uh, hands that touch, as we see in allegories of the virtue of hope, like this one by Piero Palaiuolo. The Magdalene as a source of hope is also a particular type and a traditional, long-established type of the saint. And uh, I show you the, the, the early altarpiece of the Magdalene that we've looked at with Lisa, made around 1280, where her scroll counsels sinners not to lose hope. Do not despair those of you who are accustomed to sin, and in keeping with my example, return yourselves to God. <coughs> so to conclude, we've uh, explored some of the many messages that this figure of the Magdalene might have had for her original or, uh, owner or viewers. Uh, made in humble clay, painted in naturalistic colors, perhaps embellished with gold to highlight her holiness, this powerful athlete of virtue, this blessed sinner, accompanies the viewer into the wilderness on a spiritual pilgrim pilgrimage towards salvation. She purifies with her emotions and her tears. She's given spiritual and physical sustenance by angels. She offers hope to the sinner and models penitence for the devotee. She's like Florence herself and all her citizens, and held in the private spaces of home or convent. This figure allows the individual to travel beyond the confines of daily life into a journey of repentance, devotion, cleansing, and the hope for salvation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marietta. And I'd like to introduce our last speaker, Jerry Strickler, who is Associate Objects Conservator at the MFA Boston, the woman who really helped out our Mary Magdalene. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks. Um, I have a lot of images to uh, share with you today, beginning with the um, images of the figure, how it looked before conservation. Um, the figure has extensive cracking, complete horizontal cracking in the base and the stump, at the ankles, the knees, the wrists, the waist, and most notably the neck. And I suspect that some of this was um, impact damage, but some of this is um, attributed to the cracks that can develop uh, from the strains of fabrication. Um, and you'll notice some of the lighter colored areas of more freshly exposed um, ceramic there. Probably chips from um, flaking paint or impact as well. As Marietta has said, terracotta means baked earth and um, it's true terracotta is considered to be a very plastic material. Um, the more plastic, the more relative amounts of water is needed to, to work terracotta. And upon drying and subsequent firing, the clay plates compress and, in a stacked lamellar uh, form. And the structure of, of a clay figure could shrink as much as an inch for each foot. Um, with the loss of that water. And so hand-built figures like this one are more conducive to stresses in the clay, more air pockets, which lead to a possibly more fragile structure. And because of firing, the use of internal armatures is not usually um, used, uh, although some of, sometimes they are, and then it's a matter of going back in and opening up the figure again and removing those armatures once the clay is more leather hard, and then sort of piecing your figure back together. But this figure is almost completely solid. Um, 
tool marks are not highly defined on the surface, or maybe the restorations kind of hide them. Uh, but they, as you can see under the base, there are very strong figure, uh, finger marks from the sculptor. The other um, things that you see there are mounting putties and waxes that were previously used. Previously applied uh, bees, uh, uh, wax-based fills, probably beeswax, uh, were located over repaired breaks at the stump and the hair very much in the dress and um, her proper left foot. The surface decoration is paint and it's not glaze. No fabric was incorporated as some larger sculptures tend to have. Um, oil and or re resin paint layer is here, it's lean, and in some areas under heavy retouching. So I didn't see an overall ground layer um, under magnification or gold leaf or other embellishment. Uh, but is it, when I look at this figure, I often wondered, was it supposed to have such strong shading as we were seeing, especially in the lines of the face? So I had a lot of questions when I was looking at this sculpture at the beginning. and. Um, not just about the surface, but about the structure. Examination under long wave ultraviolet light did not produce a strong fluorescence, though what was there was varied. An induced green fluorescence was seen mostly in the lower stump and the base, and the brown paint also. Some of the pale skin possibly had some faint green to it. Um, both the eyes and mouth had strong green dots to it. Um, most retouching showed an absorption of the ultraviolet light, which would be over top of that otherwise fluorescence I would see. So was there an older resin varnish or painting medium that I was seeing in there? And the goals of the treatment were jointly decided with the curators at this museum. And, Stabilization was clearly needed regardless of possible exhibition just for the purposes of handling and, and safe storage. The weight-bearing cracks at the ankles and the base were of most concern. We wanted to look at the paint layer more closely with magnification. We didn't take samples at that point, and, but the paint needed some stabilization in some areas. Surface clean definitely to reduce some of the modeling and expose more original paint. And we sort of wanted to expose more of the form, of the original form that was there as much as possible as well. Um, and that would be reducing the previous restorations uh, appropriately and, uh, and remove the fingertips to the repair there add something more appropriate and address the neck because we weren't quite sure what was going on in that area. Um, was there more original substrate and paint there? What about the tips of the hair, the chest? The base and ankle cracks were most fragile. Um, using a syringe with a needle tip and a fine tipped brush, the cracks were consolidated at the base and the stump and the legs. Very little consolidation of the paint was needed. The areas um, where this happened included also the base and the legs around the previously repaired breaks and the stump. <clears throat> we didn't pursue paint cross sections and spot testing did confirm that the paint is not readily sensitive to water nor readily sensitive to more non-polar solvents like mineral spirits. But the paint is um, clearly worn and fractured. Older layers are lean. The uh, you know dry pigment dispersed in an oil resin varnish um, based medium over terracotta would have been completely appropriate. Um, but we couldn't rule out other things like wax or, or even gouache for something like this. But I don't believe that's what we were seeing. After dusting, the face was um, aqueously surface cleaned from grime. Um, you're seeing some of the spot tests here of the cleaning surfaces. The uh, grime was reduced with um, a higher pH adjusted water to seven and a half. Um, 
on cotton swabs and uh, focusing on the darkened flesh and the hands and the legs and the proper right forearm surfaces. These were further cleaned with a very dilute chelating agent of um, diammonium citrate, which was also adjusted to a slightly higher pH of 7. To reduce the brown overpaint from certain areas of the flesh, two main mixtures of solvents were used, um, one with slightly less acetone in one part and one with a slightly more uh, four parts of acetone in an otherwise petroleum benzene type of spirits. The condition of the paint was, um, was lean and so it also prevented further work in reducing some of these top layers more safely. The restoration was painted directly over top of the other older layer. If time allowed, we probably could have spent more time working through some of those um, systems. Um, the yellow-green flesh paint layer there, yeah, that, that was reduced nicely, which revealed a lighter fill material below it. Um, and taking away that fill material was easily done with just a damp water, uh, water dampened swab, which was a nice change. Restoration materials of fills and uh, adhesives covering the original surfaces of the face and the neck were reduced, and it also revealed older, um, thin, distinct layers of hard and brittle red and gray material, <clears throat> which you can see some in here, and that it's almost like a skin of, of something. <clears throat> the, um, the solvents alternating with water helped soften these up and swell it so that it could be reduced mechanically um, with a microscalpel under magnification. The figure may have been modeled with a hollow, hollow upper torso because at the collarbone it suffered um, the structural loss and everything was crunched in. You can even see a little bit of a hollow there. Unfortunately, what was revealed and there was original ceramic still there, uh, was unusable. It was drastically out of plane, and it wasn't, there was no way to reconstruct it. Um, the fingertips were modeled by hand using epoxy putty, and it was modeled off the figure, shaped, hardened, smoothed, and then attached later as a separate piece to the figure. And I think this is also about the point where the curators were, you know, Chris, I'm sorry, yes, Claire and Eve were, were um, getting a little nervous because it starts to look worse before it starts to look better. And, um, and you can also see the extent of cleaning that I was and was not able to do up here in the faces. That is that crunched in area I was talking about. The research provided two images for reference for the project, um, a little bit of previous condition. On the left, you see a black and white illustration from the 1913 auction catalog. And on the right, you see the 67 black and white accession photograph. Though the earlier illustration didn't present adequate details in deterioration or restoration, it did provide painted details that are now more degraded or otherwise hidden under a restoration paint layer. The painted hair strands on the figure uh, are actually visible in the illustration, though maybe not quite so much um, at our viewing here. But these were located on the figure after reducing some of the grime and partial cleaning of the restoration layers. This is the proper right knee here. If we go further in to that area, you can see the flesh paint layer over the painted hair strand. And you can also see a very thin and lean paint layer in that upper right side. So here's the strand underneath of this pinkish layer. And then there's 
a slightly thin layer, which is not the terracotta skin surface. Um, it seemed to indicate to me that in, in looking at some of these areas uh, <clears throat> with magnification that the pink thicker flesh paint layer is overall in many places on the figure with that sort of dark brown grayish shading over top of that. So maybe you'll be able to find these painted details more when you next see it upstairs in the gallery. The green arrows that you see here are the ones that, um, the hair strands that were still visible to me. The figure had a disjointed gaze. Um, the eyes were losing the paint layer, which took away from that wonderful expression quite a bit. Under magnification, you can see the details of the proper right eye um, <clears throat> on the left and the, um, the proper left eyes on the right. It was decided to apply a few small dots of color to the right eye and integrate the pupil to better center her gaze. Going back to this crack diagram again, the added Green areas show where new fills were applied during the course of conservation. And using select sculptural images of Mary Magdalene from the Renaissance, as we've seen already today, this afternoon, and also the 1913 illustration of the sculpture, and even real life, looking at real life, how a collarbone is meant to be. That's what we were using. Um, to uh, reconstruct that area. And it was modeled with a very, very soft fill material that could easily be removed in the future. Toning, <clears throat> excuse me, toning was done with um, acrylics and in two stages, uh, the area first received a base terracotta color. With the exception of the neck base color, the toning was done with a fine tipped brush and the paint was applied in the form of dots. Areas that received the toning are the face, the neck, the elbows, the forearms at the repairs, the hands, the legs, and repairs at the base. As the treatment progressed, it was clear that a certain amount of flesh paint integration was needed, um, perhaps more than we originally expected, and and I think part of that was because of the, the cleaning just was not as, um, as a, I want to say aggressive, but it didn't produce a further original older surface by removing some of those upper layers as much. The, um, the areas were isolated with a resin and then the, um, the acrylics were used to bridge some of those gaps. And so if you note the forearms in these pictures, and here's a detail and the difference in the after treatment. So within the areas of paint loss, um, the, the flesh, there are, there are dark edges that do not reduce um, from the cleaning, and they reinforce this unwanted mottled look of the paint. The darkness could be a result of a partially cleaned surface, embedded grime or retouching maybe at that interface where the older paint and the terracotta substrate meet. Addressing that interface to uh, reintegrate the paint layers better was what was needed, and I think that we were all more satisfied. The workspace um, during the course of treatment changed over time, and the lighting slightly changed as well. So for some reason, the before treatment images really pop with a certain amount of color, but I'm gonna go through some of these after treatment images with you. The, um, the examination um, of the object during the whole course of this project revealed that the sculpture was fabricated with um, known techniques and materials consistent with the Renaissance terracottas. But I would definitely suggest in the future, perhaps radiography and paint analysis could be um, part of future study of the figure. The uh, current surface is a combination of extensive overpainting throughout the figure 
with the partially remaining thin and degraded older layer visible in some areas. I hesitate to say original because I really don't know, but there is definitely an older layer. The extensive cracks, previously repaired, repaired breaks, and structural fills limit the future handling and tr possible travel of the figure. It's unknown if pins were added during the course of previous restorations along the breaks. I am very glad that the Davis is continuing to research and expand what they know about this sculpture. And being part of the presentation today and the preparation for the 2016 reinstallation of the galleries was extremely rewarding. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you to all of our presenters for really interesting presentations on our sculpture. And I'd like to invite um, Lisa, Marietta, and Jerry to join us up front by the water bottles. And um, I'd like to give you the opportunity to ask questions to our presenters once they've had a chance to take their seats. Yes, please. I have a question for Jerry. You mentioned something about um, a dark grayish flesh tone. Um, was that intentional, that they wanted to look, make her look as emaciated and drawn, uh, or was that the way the paint deteriorated to turn gray? That, that paint layer was actually quite, had quite more body to it, and it was over top of any of the other layers. So as a later uh, retouching, or redefining some of the details that had thinned out and worn away is what I was, I'm assuming. Okay. Yes. Um, this is also for Jerry, but in one of the photographs, this area of the Magdalene's chest was very like, like skin tone pink. Was that, what, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> some of that was actually, uh, some of the uh, the terracotta color itself, but it was not necessarily a previously painted terracotta. It was some of the substrate that was found right there, and then right next to it, it might have been a uh, an actual display surface uh, of of the terracotta. Also, not in the right spot, so it was a little bit of different things. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, I'm very interested in the um, issue of clay coming from the Arno um, Valley, and it's a question in a way both for both of you. Are there ways of getting even closer to where clay came from um, when you're doing this kind of much later analysis? I mean, hundreds of years. <laughs> I want to believe so. Uh, this is something that I've talked a lot to our conservators about. Uh, for example, for Delarobia sculpture, because we know that the Delarobia own land on the Arno, and so I'm trying so, to figure out if you could actually localize clay. But they keep telling me not really, probably not. It's all Arno clay. So you probably can get uh, somewhat close. And I know that there, has been, there have been studies in um, myolica uh, clay where they're trying to be able to localize the clay. I think, I believe that that's a future possibility that we want to, I don't, so I don't, that's, that's me hoping. <laughs> as far as I know, the, the testing is, is dealt mostly with the mineral content and impurities. So if you have, um, a great deal of samples for comparison and you can have that body of knowledge for the trends then it's great but I I think people are not convinced that we're there yet so the more samples and the more testing that happens the better off that we'll, we can trace those sources better yes please your presentations were just marvelous I would love to see the three of you collaborate on a book <laughs> based on these three lectures, it would be certainly a, a valuable resource to people who 
you know, who are, are taken with the whole idea of Renaissance sculpture and the beauty of it and the, uh, the spiritual application to modern times. So give it some thought. <laughs> I have sort of a formless question that I hope when I start talking turns into the question. But um, I was really interested, Lisa, in your um, in the image, the, the 13th century altarpiece image um, of the Magdalene with the scenes along the side, and then the um, the sort of picture, the illustrative picture you showed of on the elevation of the host, and your sort of idea about elevation and elevation. And for a while, I started thinking a lot about that sort of combined. I think it's a really great thought, this idea of the elevation of the Virgin and the host being elevated in front of her, um, the Eucharist. But um, I was wondering a little bit about those terracottas of the elevation, because um, there's something that strikes me. Is I've seen a lot of elevations, and there's no host at all. I was sort of thinking about that. Thinking a lot of times, she's not actually being fed. She's just sort of elevated, and you never see a, an elevation Post there, it's not always, but there's a lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> you see that. exactly. Yeah. So, you, so then Marietta brought one like that. Uh, but I was thinking about that in a in a domestic setting and the way that those terracottas would have been displayed, um, and so sort of how how one would have interacted with some of the with some of those terracottas in, in the domestic setting. Of, um, you know, they're sort of all pieces. Right? Yeah, yeah like it because they are reliefs, and so they probably if someone asked. Just did I think it had a frame? I think it probably, they probably didn't have frames, but I think that they certainly were mm -hmm. and mounted on the wall in some way. So, yeah, when I was talking about that, I really just wanted everyone to focus on the feet. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah, she wasn't standing <laughs> flat on the ground, she's sort of hovering, and it just, I, I think that that was one of the, the things that made the Domitello so compelling is this combination of aspects of her personality. And as far as the mandorla shape goes, mm -hmm. that has a lot of resonances with images of the Virgin right. in Florence as well, of course, because mm -hmm. of uh, the Porta della Mandorla or the, uh, the uh, Rossellino tomb in Santa Croce, which has a very similar. And I also read somewhere, and I'll, I'll ask you, Lisa, this, that sometimes she's compared to the almond, and I was, you know, the mandorla is some bitterness and sweetness. Oh. And I, I didn't want to go too far with that, but I thought, well, maybe there is something to that. But I think it does, it, it very specifically relates to those more famous uh, uh, sculptures in Florence for the format. Yeah, the bitterness thing, I don't know. That's just in the Golden Legend is the only place that I've seen. And he has about 20 different meanings, different meanings. Yes. This is a little off topic, but uh, no one spoke about how this piece came down to the Davis. And I'm curious. It was purchased in 1967, and it was purchased from a gallery. I think Alicia said she just sent you the, uh, the what was the name? Edward Lubin Gallery. And then we found, it, as you saw, images from an auction catalog at the beginning of the century. But. It was in the uh, it was in the sale of, uh, from one of the Volpi collections, so it did pass through uh, the, a dealer in Florence in the early twentieth century. So, but beyond that, we know nothing. Really. Yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> Can you like? <laughs> well, no, I don't know about the specific, but it was bought uh, at a time when uh, Curtis Shell, who was a Florentine specialist, spent <coughs> a lot of time also in Florence and and was particularly interested in. Uh, that kind of object, which of course um, was more available for the budgets that there were at that mm -hmm. time, uh, which were very skimpy, um, so that, you know, was lucky to find something uh, that was quality and so on. So, the pre-turn of the century, pre-turn of the previous century, we knew, we knew nothing about how it got out of church. I think that's probably true. Mm -hmm. that, um, that's about as far back as we've been able to trace it. Thank you. Yeah. I think I saw, maybe I saw a question yeah. in the back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, unfortunately, I missed um, part of the lecture, so I apologize if this was talked about uh, before. 
Um, and this is definitely um, a little abstract um, and different than the other kinds of questions, but um, I know the Catholic faith is like very interested in, or especially during this time, the Catholic Church is um, a lot about symbols and um, symbols becoming more than symbols, um, kind of incarnations even, especially like with the Eucharist, obviously, it's not just like um, the flesh and blood it's, uh, or a symbol, it's, it's the real thing. And when I look at this statue, um, I feel in a way um, that it's something more than just a depiction. I don't know if, that, if people would have approached something like this um, as having more than just being more than just a representation or being like a, a sort of incarnation of, of the um, of Mary Magdalene herself. I know it's kind of a, a weird question, but it did any do you any yeah. <laughs> A couple, uh, I'll, maybe you want to say something, uh, but I will say one thing. Um, it would be really bad for the person to, in, in the Catholic faith, it would be really bad to think that was the Magdalene. But it's very important that it, it's a channel <coughs> towards the Mary Magdalene uh -huh. or towards other kinds of prayer. That's kind of actually what led to the Protestant Revolution, right. because this, the, 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 the Protestant Reformation. Because you, you don't want to show an object the same kind of devotion and prayer and uh, um, that you would show or feel for the actual. <laughs> uh, so, but I think those lines get blurred for sure. So. And I think that she's that type of an individual, the type of a figure because she's so flawed mm -hmm. right, that yeah. you can identify with it. And Marietta's uh, discussion about the medium being part of the message, I think is also really important to that. She draws you in no matter what the representation is and kind of asks you, not that a sculpture speaking to you, but you know what I mean, to, to, to step into her shoes and, and repent the way she repented and to be transformed the way that she's transformed. So. I think the goal of any good sculpture is to get you in there and to get you to think of yourself as in the shoes yeah. of the work of art, but stopping before okay. we get to idolatry. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I came late to, I'm sorry for that. Um, I, I came here about a few, few years ago, and there is a painting in the Davis of a figure like that. And in the background is the garden scene where Christ Mary Magdalene sees Christ and thinks he's the gardener and doesn't recognize him, that he's right after the resurrection. And he says, do not touch me. And it says in the back of this painting, no lo tangere or something. But the frame said Mary of Egypt on the bottom. So when I went home, I emailed somebody at Davis. And I said, I think it's misidentified. I thought that Mary of Egypt was the main thing. And there's a reference to maybe another Mary patron saint relationship, you know, of Mary Magdalene in the background. <coughs> and I got an email back saying, no, it's it's Mary Magdalene, which this is kind of explains a lot to me, that, you know, that there was this image um, in the Renaissance that was Mary Magdalene. Um, but the it, it would have been helpful if the little explanation had said, this is Mary Magdalene and explain why the frame said Mary of Egypt. You know, it was confusing. And the, the other point is a priest told me recently, which I knew, that the Catholic Church is kind of rehabilitating the Absolutely. image of Mary Magdalene. Well, they did in um, yeah. Vatican II. Right. And he said, said, no, she's not. A she's the apostle to the apostles. <laughs> she's the most important person that tells the apostles that Christ is risen because he tells her in the garden. <coughs> and then she goes back and tells everyone they don't believe her, they go to the the tomb themselves to check it out and everything. But um, so that's a reversal of this image of Mary Magdalene. She's a powerful um, woman. And she was supposed to be very, very beautiful. So I'm shocked at how hideous uh, she looks in this thing. I mean, I'm used to penitential saints. You know? um, but you've done a lot to, to well, make her look a little bit more like I'm Mary assuming Mary. you she missed a little bit of the beginning because I did try to address some of those. But for your um, point on Mary of Egypt, it's really funny because that's really more an Eastern saint, right. uh, but she does show up in the West. And when she does show up in the West, it's really hard to tell them apart. Right. Uh, she's thin and emaciated and out in the wilderness and has her hair covering her. Uh, so sometimes in museums, 
um, they are misidentified. Right. It is possible. Um, <coughs> the only thing that I was able to figure out is that sometimes, or oftentimes, Mary of Egypt has these three lumps near her because for 30 years, all she had was three loaves of bread. So when you see three loaves of bread, it's Mary of Egypt. <laughs> okay. Well, the only other, my final comment is, um, biblically, she's rather beautiful and it doesn't say that exactly, but um, she, she, she has the ointment and she anoints the body and she sees Christ in the garden and maybe she washes his feet, I can't remember. But all this other stuff about her being penitential is not scriptural, it's tradition. Um, Correct. That was actually yeah. what the subject of my talk was, which yeah, I'm sorry, I think you missed in the beginning, but that yeah. comes from legends, which are extra yeah, well, scriptural. that she's in France, in Vézalé, mm -hmm. France, or something, yes. they have her head or something. You know, it's all this tradition. Okay. Yes. No, it's just uh, interesting that they, uh, uh, of Egypt and um, the Magdalene get sort of separated again in the late 16th century, don't they? Where you've got in Tintoretto's paintings in the uh, Scuola di San Rocco, there is a Mary, there's a Mary of Egypt yeah. and a Mary Magdalene. And there are examples of her. It's just more rare. Um, and it's interesting to read I don't exactly know why they got conflated, but Mary of Egypt's biography was written in the seventh century, and the, <coughs> the, the monk who wrote the Vita Eremitica in the eighth century was probably Byzantine, <coughs> living in southern Italy. So there's some sense that those came together and then more penitents were heard. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. And certainly, if you have more questions, our presenters will be here, and you can come up and speak to them during the reception. I would also urge you to go visit the sculpture in person. Uh, she is on level four in our Italian Renaissance Gallery, or sorry, broadly speaking, Renaissance Gallery. There are a few northern pieces in there as well, which is just it's hard to explain with our staircase, but just keep going up until you see the L4 sign, and then take a left if you end up on this side, and take a right if you find yourself facing British portraiture. <laughs> and thinking through the history of art, you should chronologically be able to find your way to the Renaissance. So um, go forth, enjoy the sculpture, and thank you so much for coming. And thank you, speakers. It was wonderful.